Okay, we are totally keeping it in La Familia this year. All of our speakers are uh, people we know through friends and family, and we're so excited to have them all. Um, and that, because that's, you know, that is where we learn the most is from our, our inner circle and our families and our culture. And um, being able to share that with all of you is just an amazing opportunity for us. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, again, thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, this is our fourth year that we have celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month like this with a, with a speaker series. And the theme this year is Latinos Driving Prosperity, Power, and Progress in America. So we are super excited tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Aurora, who is going to talk to you about translation. Gracias, señora Benítez. Muy buenas tardes, padres de familia. Bienvenidos y gracias por estar en este webinario de Adelante Latinos. Acompáñenos a nuestra serie anual por esta semana y las siguientes dos semanas para aprender de renombrados profesionales latinos que sirven a sus comunidades de diferentes maneras. El tema para el mes de la herencia hispana de este año 2023 es Latinos lograr la prosperidad, el poder y el progreso en América. Animamos a ustedes, padres de familia, y a sus estudiantes del quinto al doce grado a participar en estos webinarios para aprender y aumentar el conocimiento de nuestra herencia hispana. Y para escuchar este webinario en español, haga clic en el icono de interpretación y seleccione español. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos de nuevo. Thank you so much, Aurora. Thank you for um, GUSD um, for helping to provide translation to our families as, as well as the Zoom. Um, and speaking of GUSD, our illustrious, amazing, awesome uh -huh. interim superintendent, Dr. Darnika Watson just joined us. And would you like to say a few words, Dr. Watson? I would. Your words are also always so kind, Ms. Benitez. It is an honor and a treat. I'm excited. It has been a fun field, busy day um, being in the field, but I am excited to be back here to hear Dr. Oviedo speak and um, celebrate her success. And I had the opportunity to see her at um, at the uh, Teacher of the Year Award luncheon this past uh week and excited um, that she reminded me about Coach Oviedo at CV. And so I'm just really excited to hear. And I know that she has a lot uh, to share. I'm eager, uh, excited about her energy and just all that she's going to bring and share in this speaker series. So thank you for grabbing her and, and bringing her on board. And I look forward to the presentation. And thank you everyone for taking time out um, to just share in this wonderful experience um, with our district. Thank you, Mrs. Benito and your team, your committee for making sure this happens every single year. It's such an exciting time. Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Watson. And and again, thank you to you and uh, President of the Board, uh, Ms. Mrs. Jennifer Freeman, all the support that we, we received from GUSD um, in order to put events like this on. So I, I don't I don't think Mrs. Freeman has joined us tonight, but um, but thank you to, the, to you and the board for, for your leadership. And um, we are in partnership with uh, Glendale Public Libraries for National Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and we love our Glendale Public Libraries and Glendale Latinos Association also supports us as well. We always work in tandem together um, to support our Latino students. Um, something I wanna share as well is that last year, and we're doing this again this year, um, for the city of Glendale, we'll be receiving a proclamation acknowledging um, Hispanic Heritage Month in Glendale. So we'll be um, headed to the um, city council meeting on October 10th. Uh, GLA and Adelante Latinos will be there. Feel free to join us, students, parents, um, in this celebration because uh, of what, what an awesome thing it is to have the city council recognized this month as well. So thank you to them for that. Um, our social media, if you've been with us before, you kind of know the drill, but please uh, make sure you're following us. Um, keeping in tune with us, uh, getting our channel on YouTube so you can watch the videos. And there we go. Uh, like I said, this is our third speaker. Um, we had the Commissioner Gonzalez. We've had a former student, Emma Gonzalez. By the way, they're not they're not related, but uh, that's okay. Um, and then tonight, our, our illustrious Dr. Monica Oviedo. 
um, who we're going to introduce in just a minute. Um, our moderators tonight, myself and Savannah Yanis, a student from Christina Valley High School, and our amazing Zoom host, Dr. Bill Estrada Gallimore. So by the way, none of this happens without him. So thank you very, more, very much, Dr. Gallimore. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Savannah, who will introduce um, Dr. Oviedo. Thank you so much. Um, today we have Dr. Monica Oviedo, the superintendent of the Whittier Union High School District. Um, Dr. Monica Oviedo has been an educator for 34 years, 27 in the Whittier Union High School District, where she currently serves as Whittier Union superintendent and a term that began in June of 2022. Prior to, appoint to her appointment as superintendent, Dr. Oviedo served six years at the cabinet level. As assistant superintendent of educational services, she supported the district's robust prof professional learning efforts, expansion of the students' well-being program, as well as implementation of a new of new courses, including ethics studies. Prior to her role in educational services, she served as an assistant superintendent of business services, where she oversaw a $175 million budget and established an $11 million transportation enterprise fund. In 2019, Dr. Oviedo was selected as a ACSA Region's 15th CBO of the Year. Dr. Oviedo served as a site administrator for 16 years, including two successful principalships in Whittier Union at Santa Fe and Pioneer High School. Some of their successes include California Distinguished School, Title I Academic Achievement, Gold Ribbon, AVID National Demonstration Site Status, and a CSBA Golden Bill for the Community Partnership. Additionally, Dr. Oviedo uh, named, was named Secondary Principal of the Year for, uh, for ACSA Regions 15 in 2009. Dr. Oviedo has a Bachelor's in History from UCLA and a Master's and Doctorate in Education from USC. She is currently a resident in Whittier with her husband, Robert, a teacher in neighboring school district. They have two sons, AJ, a uh, teacher in Glendale Unified, and Josh currently studying to be a pilot. And now I'm going to hand it over to Monica Oviedo. Well, thank you so much, Savannah, and thank you so much for this opportunity. And hello to everyone of the 81 participants that I can see, and to my own son, AJ, who I uh, coach Oviedo. I appreciate you being on um, today. And I do, I'm going to share of my experience, um, but I also want to encourage questions because this, if it's just going to be me talking um, without some feedback, that's that's so hard because I can't see any of your uh, faces. And so I, I definitely want to make sure that I'm meeting your needs and I'm answering your questions. And if in any of my experience resonates with you, uh, if I can share more of that, you know, that's definitely a goal um, that I have. And so um, I actually put this slide together. Uh, but before I do, let me share with you just one kind of thought. I'm going to share my story and my story is unique to me. And so that's just something that's really important for me to share because I don't want you to think that, you know, one of the things that we hear often is that Latinos are not a monolith. We're not all the same. And so um, I just want to kind of throw that out from the beginning that that what happens in my experience is, is only my experience. And, and, and there are many other um, experiences out there. And so mine is as a fifth generation Mexican American um, who has lived in California her whole life and is, I'm a monolingual speaker. So um, um, Aurora, thank you so much for translating uh, for me. I, I really appreciate uh, that. And if I'm talking too quickly and you need me to slow down, uh, please let me know. So with that, let me kind of share with you growing up, these, these photos that I'm, I am put on this, this screen are so important to me for a couple of reasons, and I thought they would help guide uh, my conversation. And, and one of the big questions, overarching themes as I was reading about um, today and what I would speak about was how has my culture shaped who I am? And so sharing about my parents and my grandparents and the impact that they had um, on me are, are really, really important. And so if I could I'd show you to the bottom of that screen of me, my, my grandparents are on the bottom right. Uh, and that was a picture taken at my parents' wedding um, more than almost 60 years ago now. And my, my grandparents were actually um, born and raised 
um, in different parts of, of the country. Um, my father's family, who are the two um, the two folks in the on the right of that photo, my, my grandmother in the blue and and my grandfather, my father's father on, on the right there, um, they actually were born and raised in New Mexico. And during the Great Depression, they there wasn't a lot of work in New Mexico. And so they my grandfather moved to during as part of the New Deal programs, moved to California. And he did that by way of a, a, a New Deal program called the Civilian Conservation Corps. And that's something we do teach in U.S. history, uh, the CCC. And so he ended up finding himself in the Sierra Nevadas, um, working outdoors with a lot of other young men, um, cle clearing fire trails and rebuilding building um, national parks, and then eventually came to Los Angeles and settled there and um, found his way into becoming um, in law enforcement. And he started at the time in law enforcement, it was, you actually had to hit out a lot of money. And so he started as a sheriff because that was a little bit less expensive, uh, bought his own uniforms and did his own training. And then eventually um, shifted over to the Los Angeles Police Department. And uh, one of the kind of cool things that I found out later um, was that he was one of the first Mexican-American detectives um, on the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, he also was um, uh, involved in a very famous um, assassination that happened in Los Angeles. The assassination, he was the lead detective uh, on the um, interviewing of a uh, um, a Sirhan Sirhan, who was the person who admitted to assassinating um, Bobby Kennedy um, here in Los Angeles at the um, um, at the Ambassador Hotel. And so um, it's a little bit of a living history, kind of a, a little bit of a dark history, I guess, that he had to do that, but that that he was so respected um, in the Los Angeles Police Department as a detective that he had that um, ability to do that. And so the, my father's family, they grew up in Los Angeles, as I said said, and in um, a part of Los Angeles that's very near to Dodger Stadium uh, called Highland Park or Mount Washington. Um, my mother's family, so my, my mom's mom is there in the yellow, and her husband, they were more from the Boyle Heights part of um, East Los Angeles, and they were um, more of working class. So both of them were uh, union workers. One, my grandfather as a machinist, and my grandfather as a, um, or sorry, my grandmother worked for um, Carnation, um, which was made ice cream and, and all kinds of dairy products. And so um, while I, I'm just going to kind of ask, I'm just checking on the questions. I, I guess Ms. Dr. Gallimore will kind of interrupt me, hopefully, if there's any questions. Um, so that's a little bit about my grandparents. Um, my Real quick, Dr. Oviedo. So yes. Savannah, since she wants questions, um, if you since you're moderating, go ahead and, and um, you can let her know when there's questions and maybe there's a group of them you can ask. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. okay. Awesome. And I was able to open up the chat. So I, I'm also going to be able to monitor that. So that's a little bit about my grandparents' um, experiences um, growing up and coming into Los Angeles. Um, my parents, they're the ones that you'll see up right next to the USC. And that's uh, my parents' uh, most recently, about a year and a half ago, and they, like many, many Los Angelinos, they decided that they would move out of the city after they got married, and they moved to a suburb, which is very, very common. Uh, many uh, Mexican-Americans that were from Los Angeles, they moved into the suburbs of Pico Rivera and Whittier, and my, that's exactly what my parents did. They moved into Whittier um, just in the year that I was born, uh, so back in 1968, uh, they moved to Whittier, and that's where I was raised, born and raised here in Whittier. Um, Whittier today is very, very diverse um, and largely Latino, but Whittier of 1968, that was not the case. I was one of many, um, one of, uh, sorry, very few uh, Latinos. There were very few brown faces um, in school. And so as I look at kind of my class pictures, I was one, I think there was one other uh, friend that I had um, that had a, a Hispanic surname. 
And so it's really kind of a testament to the change that has happened in Whittier, uh, because now the district that I serve is more than 90% Hispanic Latino. Um, and at that time, very, very uh, small number. So I grew up in Whittier, went to a number of schools. Um, it was by the time I got to school age, we were in going through with the baby boom had happened and the uh, enrollment in schools was dropping significantly. And so as a result, I found myself over at my elementary school experience going to about five different schools in seven years. And I, I share that because I think that also speaks to a little bit about why I am and why I feel this very, very strong need uh, to ensure that all of our students and our schools feel safe, that they feel seen, and that we have programs to make sure that everyone feels welcomed and belonging. Um, so I grew up in Whittier. I went through the schools in Whittier, um, went to a high school at um, a local um, Catholic high school that was nearby, although my experience from K-8 had been in public school. Um, I followed my best friend on to a Catholic high school, and that decision was really important um, in, in that it allowed me years later uh, to meet my husband. Um, but I went to Catholic high school, and I went to high school in the 1980s. And for those of you who are history, uh, familiar with your history, you might know um, that there was a time in the 80s where we had something called affirmative action, um, where there were large efforts to ensure that our colleges were accepting students that looked more like the communities that they were serving. And so when I was a senior in high school, uh, I actually had a UCLA, uh, come to our high school and they looked at our, our transcripts. And if we had the minimum requirements to go um, to college, you know, those A through G requirements with, with C's or better, then we would be tentatively or provisionally approved, accepted into the university. And so that was my first experience with um, looking at colleges. UCLA looked at my transcript. I had A's and B's in all of my um, classes. And they said, okay, if you keep these grades up for the last three months of your senior year, you'll be accepted to UCLA. CLA. And so I said, great, I'm done. I don't need to apply anymore. Uh, and so other than my UC applications, I, I actually didn't apply um, anywhere else for college because I had been you know, provisionally accepted and I made sure my grades were good enough to get into UCLA. Um, and so when I got to UCLA, boy, was it a culture shock. I went from a small Catholic high school where there were no more than 300 students in my entire graduating class to a university that had more than 30,000 students. And so classes, I was normally in classes with about 20 students, and now I found myself in classes with 400 to 600 students in a lecture hall. And that was a huge eye-opener for me. Um, it was the first time I was away from home. I was living on campus. And uh, as you can imagine, as a, I was 17 years old when I started college, I really found myself um, a little bit overwhelmed. Um, and really there's a, a term called imposter syndrome where you believe that you, you're an imposter, you, you don't belong here, that everyone else at the university is smarter than you, that has more experiences than you, that they deserve to be there, but that you don't. Uh, deserve to be there. And so uh, there was a definitely in my sophomore and in junior year where I had to really um, dig deep um, and overcome a lot of self-doubt uh, in order to be successful in college and to finish college. And luckily, I had some great allies uh, at the university um, in professors that believed in me and really helped support me um, to be successful. And I was able to graduate um, in four years from UCLA, uh, but it was not without um, without some definite challenges. You know, and I often, when I'm talking to students in the class, they sometimes see the finished product of, oh, she's got her doctorate and she is, you know, now in this new role, and they think that I didn't have. Uh, struggles. And that is certainly not the case. I definitely found myself after my sophomore year of college on academic probation and really had to work hard to overcome that um, and, and, um, and to graduate um, in a timely fashion. Um, but then I graduated 
I um, applied for my first job at UCLA. You graduate, um, used to be on Father's Day on, on a Sunday. And I interviewed for my first job the following day. And it was a teaching position. And it was at my alma mater. I, I had uh, was a history major. And so I decided I would uh, become a teacher. And so I heard that they were looking for teachers at my alma mater. And so I um, interviewed the next day. And this I remember the interview. It was a very informal um, interview. And one of the questions that the principal asked at the end of the interview, he said to me, um, you know, Monica, do, do you happen to know an alumnus named Robert Oviedo? And I said, mm, nope, never heard of him. He had graduated from high school four years before me. So we were never in high school together. And so he put that, that was the first I had heard that name. And then uh, it turned out that a couple, you know, at the end of the summer, we were starting as new teachers and I was in the new teacher orientation. And I met Robert Oviedo um, as a new teacher. And, um, you know, we definitely um, saw that there was a, a love connection or a spark. And so we started dating. Uh, and then a year later, we were engaged. And two years um, from when we met, we were married. And just a couple of years later, we had our first of two sons. And so it was really meant to be, I think, that I went back to, um, I went to that high school um, and followed that friend and that I went back to become a teacher there um, because I'm still 31 years now, I've been married um, to, to Robert Oviedo, who is a teacher as well. Um, we both left um, our, our alma mater um, once we finished our teaching credentials and moved back into public education. And we are both um, enjoying our experiences there. And my husband is a teacher. He teaches social studies, ethnic studies, and um, and uh, world history. My, my maybe my son will correct me. Um, he uh, is a teacher in a neighboring school district. So that's a little bit about um, a, a leading up to my um, getting my first teaching job. And while I was teaching, I'm seeing still no questions um, coming in, but that's okay. Uh, as I was teaching, uh, I decided it was I would go back and not just get my teaching credential, but I finished a master's degree. Uh, and so that was a great experience. But again, started having those imposter syndrome feelings that I did not belong. Um, and luckily, I had an ally. Um, this By this time, I was at USC. And that ally was an, a long-term time professor um, named David Marsh. And he um, encouraged me. I was working on um, my, I was going to work on a teaching, uh, sorry, an administrative credential so that I could uh, proceed um, with an administrative credential. And he told me, hey, you know what? Maybe don't just sh sell yourself short on just doing an administrative credential. Maybe you should think of a long-term goal to get your doctorate in education. And so I didn't believe in myself, but having him put that idea and believe in me I said, okay, well, yeah, that sounds like a good goal. I'm not just going to work on a credential. I'll work on, on the doctorate. And so then for the next four years, um, I worked on completing um, the administrative credential, but then all of the coursework to get my doctorate. And so now, it, you know, I've been in, I never got out of school. I went from my, um, my bachelor's degree. I was working and finishing my teaching credential. By now I'm working on a master's um, and administrative credential to doctorate. And by this time, it's about the year 2000. And let's see, some people would like to know if you studied Spanish in high school or college. Um, I did take Spanish in college. Um, I, I took a whole year of it. It's part of um, the credential for um, teaching with English learners. And I also took it in high school. And so it's, although I'm not fluent, I understand quite a bit um, of Spanish and actually have been able to travel um, a little bit and traveled to Spain with my husband um, and was able to use my Spanish quite a bit. And so, uh, so yes, Spanish has been a tremendous um, asset for me. Um, and I'm really sad that I don't have it. I'm not a native speaker. And I think that kind of deserves a story as to why I'm not. You know, my mom and dad grew up at a time and went to school in the Los Angeles schools um, back in the 50s, in the late 40s and in the 50s. And at that time, um, much of the policies 
uh, around bilingual education were not supportive. In fact, my mom recollects being a new student um, in elementary school and when and the only language that she spoke when she started in elementary school was Spanish and being punished um, for not speaking in English. And so there were times where she was made to sit in the corner until she would agree um, to speak um, English. And so as a result of those experiences for her, she felt it was really important that in our home that only uh, English was spoken. And so that's such a, um, a, a, a tragedy in that now the only Spanish that I have is what I've learned through formal education and not from the great cultural experiences that I could have had from speaking to my parents and to my grandparents in, in um, Spanish. Um, it also says, I'm looking at the questions, also like to know how I overcame the imposter syndrome um, of being a Hispanic. And I'm going to tell you that that is something that is ongoing um, regularly. There will, and it has to do now, especially with um, when I walk into a room as a superintendent, um, I often feel like all the other superintendents in the room um, are deserve to be superintendents and they're gonna find out that I really shouldn't be one and um, kick me out of kind of the, the group. So how do I overcome that? I just think you have to have a lot of self-confidence, um, a lot um, of resilience uh, and just continue to look at each day how can I be a little bit better? How can I improve myself? Um, and But I think all of us face self-doubt and anxiety and we have to um, own that and then um, fight against that um, with, with others. So a lot of positive self-talk uh, that I, I engage in. And then I like to surround myself with others um, who are positive as well. Um, and who can help me to continue to, to be that positive um, uh, force. Um, so some other things I would want to share with you, just as far as my experiences, you know, um, uh, Savannah read my bio, um, and I've kind of walked through, you know, I was a teacher, and then I became an assistant principal, uh, and, and then I became a principal. And often what I get asked is, you know, what is... Um, did you always know that you wanted to be a superintendent? And I'm gonna tell you the answer to that was no, I did not always know that I wanted to do that. I always knew I wanted to have an impact on those who I was working with, but I didn't know, you know what the next role in my career um, plan would be. Um, but my dad, one of the key lessons he always told me was a job worth doing is worth doing well and worth doing right. And so, and that I should always look at how I can be better, to not, to not blame others when things go wrong, but look at what I could have done differently um, and how I can be involved in my own self-improvement. And so for each role that I've had, whether it be teacher, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, or even now superintendent, is always about how every day I can be better and each year I can be better. And so I'm always willing to serve in each of those roles for however long it takes until I feel like I'm doing a, a, a good job and those around me um, see that I've, I've mastered that and then tap me on the shoulder to consider the next um, growth opportunity for me. Another question in the chat says, with all the things you've experienced, what would you think the biggest change in your community needed or needs to be? Uh, and I, I would say um, for me and our community, what, what needs to be is um, how are we making sure that every student in our school is achieving at the highest levels. And that every student, when they leave high school, they have a plan for their future success. Um, and that that plan is not dictated because of the courses that we, um, that, that their plan is dictated by their desires, not by what we think as adults is best for them. And so I always like to think, um, and when I'm interacting with students is, 
you know, not everyone wants to go, not every student wants to go to college, for instance, um, but that should be their choices to make when they graduate from high school, that we've made sure that they took all of the right coursework. So every opportunity is afforded to them um, when they leave us. And so I'm constantly working with our site leaders, our administrators, our assistant principals and principals to talk about at, at in ninth to 12th grade year, are they talking about what is the plan for our students when they graduate? And can we link our kids to that plan before they leave us? So if the students know that they don't want in their senior year that they're not gonna go to college, but they really wanna go to be in a trade school, are we connecting the kids into our adult school trades or maybe to a particular employer uh, so that they can continue that? If the students know that they wanna complete a certificate program Program at the local community college, are we making sure that in their senior year, we are registering, helping them to register for that community college and so that they will have a frictionless experience in the summer between them graduating from our high schools and into um, their next career move or into that community college. So I think those are some big, um, big changes or what I want to see um, continue. I would always say continue to happen. Uh, another question that just came in. Do you think you missed out on certain aspects of your culture because you are monolingual? Oh, absolutely. I, I've missed out um, on opportunities. And I am grateful for my, my family and the cultural experiences that they did provide to me. Um, you know, my grandfather, I still, you know, as a, as a little girl, I remember the music. Um, that my grandfather used to play at different family events. He he very much loved mariachi music. And so he always made sure that that was part of our culture. And when he was alive, we used to go with him each year uh, to watch the mariachi at the Hollywood Bowl. And we would get tickets for all the family and we would um, enjoy that uh, together. Um, but there's definitely something um, lost um, in, in not being able to be a Spanish speaker. Um, but the flip side of that also is, you know, sometimes there's stereotypes about what a Latina should be. Um, and that I should be, you know, and that I should be a Spanish speaker. And unfortunately, as I said, I didn't have that opportunity. And I do appreciate it. I, I value those um, who, who do. Uh, another question that just came in, what would you say that your biggest accomplishment was as superintendent or even just the biggest accomplishment in your eyes? And I, um, so I'm going to share a personal one and then I also will share, um, a prof I certainly a professional. Um, so let me start with um, my professional. Um, I, I certainly think being able to serve as a superintendent in my own community is a, a great accomplishment. And, you know, it took me 34 years in education before I got uh, to that level. And so I'm really, really um, happy about, about that. Um, but until every student is succeeding in our district, I think that's the accomplishment that I want to make sure and the legacy uh, that I want to leave behind in, in this community. Personally, uh, I've often shared um, the why I do what I do um, as an educator, and it always has centered around, I want for the students in our school and our staff who work in our school, what I would want for my own family. And so when I was a principal, I used to say, I want my, my uh, what I would want for my own family is for all of us to, all of our kids to be college ready, college and career ready. And so my personal accomplishment, I would say, is that both of my sons um, have completed their college degrees uh, and they were able to do that very different paths that they took to complete that, but they both um, have those degrees. And I think there's so much value in a college education and how it, um, the experiences and the doors that it opens for, um, for our students and the impact, positive impact that it has for an entire family and for our entire community. And so personally, I'm very, very proud um, of my two sons and the, the path that they are both on um, for the future. Um, another question that came up is, who would you say was your biggest mentor or inspiration growing up? And I have uh, three people that I definitely think are my biggest mentors. Uh, two of them are my parents. Uh, my parents um, are 
uh, wonderful people. My father is a perfect example of work ethic um, and love for his family. And he and just really uh, believing in yourself and, and even when you're faced with challenges, looking in at how you can be a better human being and how, how you can improve um, in, in your work life and in your personal life. And, and my mom, um, she is, I don't think there's a, an, a single person in the world that has met my mom that doesn't just think she is the kindest, sweetest human being. She is friendly to everyone. She, um, she, uh, just a, a, a light, um, and of, of a good, she's a great role model as a mother. Um, she, she worked when I was trying to go to college. She um, took a job so that I could, um, go to college without having any student loan debt. And so I'm really appreciative of her. And then professionally, my largest mentor is the superintendent um, that preceded, not the one that was immediately preceded me, but the one that um, that preceded him. Um, and that was a woman named Sandra Sanchez Thorstensen. She was the superintendent for Whittier Union for about 15 years. She also um, grew up in the Whittier community, also was a Latina. And she was, from the moment I joined Whittier Union as a teacher, she served as a role model and a mentor to me each and every day. And I still talk to her all the time um, because she gives me such sound advice um, about the importance of my role, but also the importance of being a good human being and how to support um, our, our staff and, and build relationships with our staff and our community. Another question that just came in, and I really appreciate these questions. It helps to guide me a little bit. Is there a celebrity or a person of power that inspired you or that you relate to? And I have many. Um, and one of them actually um, was someone that I met that is from your community. And that is um, Congressman Adam Schiff. I had the opportunity to meet him a few years, a couple years ago, and I was so impressed. And I always knew he was brilliant and so smart. Uh, and what I was really, really impressed was I met him in the Sacramento airport and he was clearly busy going to talk to legislators um, at the Capitol. Um, and he so he was in in his area and he there were several people in the airport that recognized him and sought him out and wanted to talk to him about some of the key uh, roles and committees that he was on and some of the investigations that he was leading at the time. And he was just so, I was so inspired that he was so calm and so um, open to talking to some of his constituents um, about what, what the experience is. Um, because sometimes when you meet people that are in positions of influence, um, they, um, are sometimes they're not always exactly what you expected. Maybe they're they they're in a rush, and so they're not able to give you as much time as you would like. Uh, and so I just was really really impressed with him as a person that was um, in in such a powerful position, um, and that he was willing to give so freely of his time. And then, what would you say is your favorite part of the job? And that is the easiest. The favorite part of my job is when I get to interact with students. And that doesn't happen as much once you leave um, the school site and you are working at the district office. You really have to um, create opportunities uh, to be back on the campuses. And so this week, it, for instance, are, is my opportunity to go and visit all of the ASBs at each of our schools. And so, be a, so being able to sit in the leadership class with them and hear about all the things that they are planning um, at their schools uh, and then being able to share of my experience and, and, and ask them to always make sure that they're finding ways to include those kids who are new to their school or maybe those who are struggling um, with mental health issues and making sure that they're finding ways to link those students. That is hands down when I get to be on a campus and I really try to do that um, each week to be on campuses, visiting in classrooms, talking to kids about what they're learning, asking them what good things are happening and how I can make their high school experience even better. That is the best part of my day for sure. 
another question that came in, would you have done anything in your career different differently had you been given the chance? And I'll say no. Um, honestly, I, I loved every part of my career and the amount of time that I spent um, in each of those roles. And I know that all of those experiences helped to shape who I am and how I lead today. So I wouldn't change anything. I've loved um, every experience that I had. And I do hope that, and it's not common, you know, superintendents often um, are a position that changes um, every few years. But I do hope that I will be able to uh, finish my career um, here in Whittier if that's what's meant to be uh, for me. Uh, another question, as a superintendent, how do you make sure that students and their cultures are supported? And that's a great question because, you know, oftentimes there's so many different cultures within a community. There's so many different languages. Um, there's so many different traditions um, that are happening. And so I think that it's so important in all of the roles um, that we, ha we have a leadership within our schools that we are designing spaces for belonging and looking at um, and being open to um, how to make sure that we're inclusive. And, and a lot of that is asking questions and making sure, like for instance, uh, I was at a school and we provided lunch for the students. And I noticed that two of the students weren't eating um, the lunch that was provided. And so after the meeting was over, you know, I talked to each of those students individually and I just said, hey, you know, I really wanna make sure that um, the foods that we're providing are um, ones that are meeting your needs. Um, can you share with me a little bit about what I, you know, I noticed that you, you weren't eating. Is there anything that we could do differently to make sure that you feel included and that we're providing food choices for you? And then being able to hear um, their suggestions and then work with those um, divisions within our district to make sure that we are um, we're taking that into consideration. I think the more that we can create um, systems of belonging and design our systems and our structures so that all feel like they belong, that's so important. Um, and and also when we you know sometimes we'll make a mis I'll make a mistake, um, and I really appreciate when someone is willing to give me feedback on how I can improve uh, in, in um, those different areas of creating a sense of belonging as well. So that's important. Another question, what advice would you give to a young monolingual Latinos who struggle with their Latino identity or who are going through a situation similar to what you went through? Uh, I um, My advice um, for a young monolingual Latino is, um, well, I mean, if you're all, oh, that's the best way. Um, I definitely, ex that's okay that you are a monolingual, but always try to look at, are there opportunities for me to, to improve my um, bilingual skills? And so for me, um, that could be putting myself in situations where I'm forced to kind of stretch myself. And so I'll go to meetings where I will listen um, to conversations that are happening uh, in Spanish. And then I will check in um, with the person who was speaking after and say, okay, here's what I think I heard. Did I hear that right? Or um, sometimes if I'm going to a conference, um, we're, we're going to have a parent education conference in a couple of weeks. I'm going to, I've written um, my, my welcome speech and then I've asked my, uh, some of my colleagues to translate translate that to me. And then I will practice again and again um, to be able to speak to our families in wow. both um, of our key languages. And so uh, putting myself in opportunities. So it's okay to be monolingual. That's just, you know, that was my experience growing up. But I also recognize that I serve a community um, where many of our families are Spanish speakers. And so if I want them to feel connected, I have to stretch myself. 
um, to practice, to hear them in their um, home language and to be able to, to um, make every effort to, to use that language. And, I'll, and I always say their English is so much better than my Spanish. So willing to take that risk um, is tremendously important. Um, next, did you ever feel hopeless when you were struggling? And if so, how did you overcome that? Um, and and absolutely, I'm going to go back to when I was um, in college and I found myself on academic probation. Um, that was definitely a really, really difficult time. And it was, um, you know, I was really, really worried that my my parents were going to be tremendously disappointed in me. And so um, what I what I did is I um, sat myself down and I have the one of my key skills is that I can look at a complex problem and kind to pull it apart and look at, um, okay, what do I need to do first? What do I need to do second? What do I need to do third? And so in that scenario, I really um, realized my study habits were the key issue. And so I came up with a structure um, of how I would be able to um, take notes and then how I would review my notes again and again and again so that I would be better prepared for um, upcoming exams. I also started taking advantage of the office hours that were offered at our school um, and meeting with the TAs and, and ask, advocating for myself. Uh, and so those were a couple of the skills that I um, used when I was trying to overcome um, a challenge. And then I try to always think of, okay, even if when I'm struggling and I might feel a little bit overwhelmed in one area, just using some mindfulness techniques of kind of slowing down, um, taking some notes maybe for myself of, okay, what's really the source of this problem? How, how should I attack this, this challenge that I'm facing right now? And then I also will rely on some of my, my mentors and some of the colleagues that I work with every day and say, you know, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? And then I'll hear some feedback on why that might not work. And then I'll kind of make adjustments from there. And so those are a couple of ways. Um, what was your favorite subject in school and why? Uh, in college, it was absolutely history. Uh, I loved anything having to do with history. And so I didn't, that's not what I started college. I actually started as a biology major. I uh, thought I wanted to be a, a medical doctor and uh, realized pretty quickly at, at UCLA that the chemistry series um, was not my forte. Um, and so I shifted my major a couple times from economics to history, social science. And, and I, what I found, and, and a relative of mine had said this to me, you know, Monica, you're gonna try a lot of different courses in college and when you, you'll know when you're in classes and and you're you're inspired and it's passionate and and you're going to be successful and he was right i remember to this day um a class i took on the um roman history and i was so impressed with all the stories and the connections and the intrigue and that really then did spur me to take the history classes that i took um, and i really um, as a history major the idea that we're learning about the past so that we won't make the mistakes of the past in the present and the future um, was something that definitely resonated with me. And um, what advice would I give to someone who wants to live a successful life? I would say be your true self, be authentic to who you are um, in, in every aspect of your life. Um, and so when you do that, um, you you definitely have the skills to be successful and then surround yourself with people who can be advocates, who can be your cheerleaders, who can pick you up when you're down. Uh, and so I have friends that I have, I have some of my best friends I've had since high school and even into elementary school. And I still talk to them regularly um, and try to surround yourself also with positive people. Uh, there's, you know, today there's just so much negativity um, that it's it can be really, really overwhelming and consuming. And so the more you can um, be optimistic and surround yourself with positive people and 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 practice positive self-talk, I believe that those are the recipe uh, for success. And then my favorite moment in my career 
I think, um, and then do you have a specific moment that touched your heart and stuck with you? And yes, I absolutely do. It was 2004. I was, um, it was a May, middle of May, 2004. It was a Friday. Uh, I think it was May 14th. And it was um, the morning I was interviewing for my very first principalship. And I um, at Santa Fe High School, and I it turned, I got, I found out later that next week that I got the job. And that afternoon, I went with my family to USC and received the hood for my doctorate. And my parents were there, and my grand, my my um, my in laws were there. My husband was there, and both of my sons were there. And that was a tremendous moment uh, for me that I was surrounded that I had overcome all of that doubt, had written a dissertation, had received my doctorate, uh, and my my family and my sons were able to see that. Um, that was, for me, a, a quintessential moment that I will never forget. I have a photo of it that's in my office, uh, and I um, seek to always be role models for them, um, but also role models uh, for those, those that I interact with each day. And I'm thinking we're getting kind of close to the end. Uh, and um, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity that you have provided for me uh, today to, to share. And if there are any other questions, um, Dr. Gallimore, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Hi there, uh, Dr. Oviedo. Thank you so much. I was so impressed. You just didn't stop. You, <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and we have, we have our kids are just really curious, and they really want to know about you. And we just really uh, hold you up in your success and your hard work, and we super appreciate that. Savannah, we have time for probably one or two more questions for Dr. Oviedo. If you wanted to ask one on your own, or if you wanted to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you would like to. Uh, read anything that was left over from the chat. Savannah, are you there? I do see one. Yes. Sorry. There we go. No problem. Excellent. Yeah, we have time for probably one or two. Um, more. Go ahead, ma'am. Thanks. Someone had asked if, do you believe that moving schools all the time had an effect on who you are today? And yes. your perspective on how you see other students? Sure. So I 100% do. I, I definitely think that had an impact. You know, I in my first seven years of school, I changed schools five different times. And I changed those schools for good reasons. My parents, you know, moved from their first starter house to a little bit bigger house. Um, but as a result, I mean, that was a lot of moves um, that were happening. And so I am very, very mindful of the impact that um, whenever a student has to transfer schools, maybe because of discipline or they're new into a school or even new, even harder, even new into a co our country um, and they're new in our school, how challenging that must be for our students. And so that is one of the big things I talk to our student leaders about. Um, when you see someone new and they're eating lunch by themselves, you know, what are you doing to make sure that you're connecting them um, to other students? Because I never want our students to feel lonely or disconnected or that they don't belong. And that was the key message that I shared this year with our um, teachers and our staff. We bring all 1,100 employees to Whittier Union together on day one. And my theme for this year is you are seen and supported. And so I shared with them my experience and how hard that was as a student and how important every single role of every staff member is in connecting um, to our kids and to each other. And so that was something that was really important uh, to me. And so I definitely um, believe that that had a huge impact. Um, and another big impact, and I didn't share too much about this, you know, um, was there were times in my, when I was a little girl, where I would watch what I now realize were stereotypes again about my family. I mentioned to you that we were one of only um, a few uh, Latino families that were in Whittier in the 70s. And I remember my dad was working on the front yard. They bought the worst house on the best block in the neighborhood. And my dad was working on the front yard. And he was, you know, very dirty because he was working, you know, cleaning, tearing out things and clean, doing a lot of landscaping. And neighbors in the dish, um, in the community thought my dad was the gardener. 
And so asked him if they didn't know that he was the homeowner. And so I remember as a little girl, I was only about six, but that had such an impact on me. I went door to door in our neighborhood and I introduced myself to all of our neighbors. And I said, you know, my name is Monica. My maiden name is Melendris. And we just moved in down at this house. This is our house address. And we're Mexican. Because I wanted to make sure that everybody um, in our neighborhood knew that and, and didn't make that mistake again. Uh, and, you know, that was just from them not knowing. Once they got to know my dad, those same people became very, very close with them and they had great relationships. Because one of the things we know is when you know someone's story, it's really difficult to not be able to build a relationship and to engage with them. And so um, that's so important that we're building relationships. You know, there's a, an old saying, you can't capture someone's head until you capture their heart. And so it's so much more important to build relationships with our students first, and then eventually we'll teach them the content they need to know. Savannah, we've got time for one more quick question. If you have something you're curious about or something, something that one of our viewers is. <clears throat> Um, I think that the main thing is, did you have anyone who you related to? Like, I, I know that your story is like, so unique to you, but was there somebody growing up who had something similar or who understood you in a way that nobody else did because they had a similar experience to you? I think that's one of the reasons why I connected so much with that superintendent. Miss, um, we call her Mrs. T in our area because she did have, a. I mean, she was about 10 uh, years older, 13 years older than me, but she had those same experiences that I had had, she had. And so having her as that role model and, and being able to, and it's somebody that I could engage with and talk with um, was, was really um, important for me. That's great, Savannah. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Oviedo, I uh, want to thank you again for coming and joining us. Um, I did have uh, one other question for you. Give me just a second, please. Sorry, I'm juggling a little bit. Um, what is it like to have, uh, I'm not sure, I know one son who is teaching. What is it like to have somebody follow in your footsteps? Um, that is, it's, it's wonderful. And, and the conversations that we have around the dinner table and I mean, just even this, I mean, and he teaches us so much, um, just this week, he was sharing with us so much about, um, about living history, um, that's happening, um, in, um, historic Armenia. And, and that's something that in our community, we don't have a large Armenian population. And so, I mean, the amount of knowledge that our son has and how passionate he is about what's happening um, and the support, um, all the different supports uh, that, that your district is having to make sure that this is front and center uh, for the students um, is tremendously important. I'm also so impressed with the ethnic studies. We, we talk about his eth ethnic studies is a new uh, course that's being offered and he's teaching that and my husband is teaching that and watching the two of them share stories. Um, it's, it's a great phase of our lives to have adult children and both of them are passionate about what they're doing and to be able to have those conversations. So it, it warms my heart um, to see that. Um, I try not to push too hard. Um, he he might disagree about, well, what does your lesson plans look like and how are you doing this? I try not to to go too much into you know, superintendent mode. Um, <laughs> it is um, it, it is fun to to have um, your children follow in your footsteps uh, a little bit, although I know he's braving his own path for certain. Absolutely. And I have to tell you, from my side, it's really amazing to have not one but two Oviedos in the house. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and energy around this. Everyone, I'd like to just show you that uh, our next meeting for our uh, Adelante Latinos event uh, is going to be at Acapulco Restaurant um, over uh, off of Pacific and on uh, November 1st from 5 to 6.30. We do a number of fundraisers for raising money for our scholarship fund. Uh, we, we are arranging these now, so stay tuned for more information. We'd also like to call your attention to some uh, items coming up. The 2023 Glendale Dia de los Muertos is going to save the date for November 4th. Uh, we're gonna have students hopefully from all over uh, Glendale be able to uh, participate, including performances, dance, music, and you can even uh, join and, uh, uh, and make an ofrenda for you, you and your loved ones. 
Also, um, in Pasadena, the Tournament of Roses Committee has, um, you can enter some art, paintings, drawings, calavera, ofrendas, digital art. Uh, it, it, the due date to enter that competition is Friday, October 13th. Um, and you can get more information on our website, www.geosd.net slash adelante. Um, also, uh, from our own very own uh, Doña Dermis Ropian uh, and the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, we get information there. If we also have a sign up for our uh, information uh, for our email list. You can sign up by filling out a free form at our website, again, geosd.net slash adelante. Muchas gracias. Dr. Oviedo, it was an amazing, amazing time to have you here. And we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And also, just to let you know, next week, we have two back-to-back -back, uh, webinars um, on October 3rd. Come and uh, meet Isabella C. Guzman, who works for uh, the Biden White House. Folks, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Dr. Oviedo, thank you. We're signing off. Take care and have a great night. Bye-bye.